like to introduce Leslie now. So Leslie Gourlay is Senior Lecturer in Contemporary Literacies in the Department of Culture, Communication and Media at UCL Institute of Education. Her background is in applied linguistics and her current research interests include academic textual practices, post-human and social material perspectives on higher education and the implications of digital mediation for the contemporary university. Fascinating um, talk to follow. I'm afraid mine is, is rather more um, related to the day-to-day the -day, um, world of the university, but I hope I can make some connections in terms of um, some of the points being made about materiality in particular. Okay, so um, yeah, as uh, Janneke said, I'm, I'm from UCL Institute of Education. And I'll just crack on because we don't have a lot of time. That's my title. I'm, I don't know how how far I'll get. I've got a few little bits and pieces to talk about. So if I oops, if I don't finish them all, then I'll I'll, I'll get as far as I can with it in because I'm reporting on a, an empirical project as well as trying to make some points in, in terms of theory. I want to start with a, this um, quote from Kathy, Kathy Kell, which I really like. Kathy Kell works in um, she's a linguistic ethnographer, and one of the points she makes is that. Modes and media of communication carry meanings between streams and flows that make up the texture of the contemporary world. And historically, literacy is one of the most important channels through which meanings have crossed space and time. And I think this is a really important point which has been badly neglected in um, literacy studies and also in um, higher education studies more broadly. And I suppose that one of my kind of attempts that I want to make with my work is to try to draw some connections across those, those um, gaps, I guess. Um, you'll be very familiar, I'm sure, this audience with, with the work of Catherine Hales. particularly loved this, uh, her latest book, where she makes the point that the age of print is passing and the assumptions, presuppositions and practices associated with it are now becoming visible as media-specific practices rather than the largely invisible status quo. Now, actually, I, I, I kind of agree with that up to a point, but one of the, some of the data that I want to... Um, drawn today, but I think actually does question that. And one of the points I want to make is sort of touches on the kind of what I would call the sort of persistence of print literacy artifacts in the digital. I think they're 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 not really um, it's not really possible to draw them apart. Anyway, quick point I want to make is um, one of the sort of base points of my work draws on um, new literacy studies, which came out of social anthropology in the 80s. Um, briefly. This area of work was, was quite important in terms of textual studies in, in the university because it was one of the first areas of um, theoretical development which questioned the, the notion of literacy as a kind of cognitive category of um, you know, residing in the individual and instead it, it talked about literacy as um, socially situated practice. And there's a, there's a rich body of literature out there which I don't have time to get into today, but that's kind of my first th theoretical kind of stepping stone that I want to make. Um, the notion that, that literacy is, is always situated and it's always... Yeah, th that body of work talks about it being socially situated but not materially situated. So I suppose that's one of the points that I really want to make today is that um, one of the... <laughs> I think the, the kind of missing points in that, in that area of work is um, attention to the material and the, uh, the materiality of and the embodied set of practices, that, the fine-grained granularity of those practices as they're, they're, they unfold in, in the day-to-day. -day. And this image and many of the others that I've, I'm using come from a, a one-year longitudinal study that I undertook with my colleague um, Martin Oliver at the Institute where we gave students um, handheld devices and asked them to take images and videos of their interaction with technologies and texts um, in the day to day. We see a lot of these images of, um, and the students were given very, very loose guidance, and these kind of um, points came back, which were the, the, the basis of the interviews that we did. A lot of focus on um, the very particular embodied practices of reading, and, and very often surrounded by. by artifacts and, and, and objects related to the biological, eat, eating, drinking, sitting, um, being in the sunshine, looking at the squirrels. Um, this particular student made me this slide, uh, among others, um, and she came up with that. And, you know, I, don't, I wasn't feeding her lines about spatiality and so on. I mean, this was something that she, she came up with, and I think it's a fascinating little set of, of images that 
that she, that she produced, and I'll come back to one of them in a minute. But just going back to the, the, the way that the field was developing at the time, um, I would argue that we have um, new literacy studies starting to recognise the situated nature of, of textualities. And meanwhile, um, in educational technology, the, there was a, a, an increasing recognition of, um, well, the, the complexities of day-to-day -day student practice. But then again, separately in, um, in semiotics, we had a whole body of work around multimodality and the importance of the screen. So one of the points I want to make is that these three sets of um, sort of academic endeavours, I suppose, weren't really talking to each other very much, but I think they're really interrelated. Um, I, I'm sure you're already quite familiar with some of the work of people like Gunter Kress, um, drawing out the, the importance of, of image-based semiotic resources and how really there is no such thing as a straightforward um, linguistic text. Um, some of the images in, in the data um, are... I think underline that point. Um, this, is, this comes from one of the uh, faculty. Um, so one of the, the things we did in our, our, our research project was ask people to do um, like sort of maps and, and diagrams of their day-to-day -day practice, and this is an example of that. So there's a large body of work um, drawing on these qualitative methodologies, but they need to be brought together, I would argue, into um, drawing on the best of the, this work to, to try to understand what social actors are doing in the day-to-day -day and how this, these, this, these meaning-making practices actually unfold. Um, I love that. I, I, could, I could talk for 20 minutes about that diagram, <laughs> but better not. Um, and of course, um, one of the points I would make, as I'm sure my, my co-speakers um, will be making similar points, is that in, in all of these analyses, the, the role of um, the, of objects has been elided, you know, the sort of like the central um, importance of, of artifacts of, 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 of communication and digital and literacies more generally and textuality have not been attended to particularly well. Um, drawing on Latour, um, you, you'll be very familiar with, I'm sure, but you know, I always go back to Latour for this that the, the standard paradigm of social science, the objects are not seen as, the, as part of the social. Um, but instead they're seen as a sort of back cloth or, or context for, or, or a set of tools. And I think there's a particular problem in um, educational technology where, the, where the, the discourse of tools is extremely strong. And the notion of the, 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 the binary of tool and user in particular is very problematic. And one of the points I would argue as well is that um, the, the theoretical work about semiotic, semiotic practice in text has, has tended to elide the role of, of non-human actors, when in fact they've been extremely central. Um, media theorists such as Kittler, of course, um, has um, uh, reminded us of the, of the centrality of, of, of that in, in media systems, in the university in particular, and the, the way that the non-human actors have repositioned social actors um, over the centuries. Latour's quote, which we all, you'll know very well, I'm sure, but I, I love this one all the same as if a damning curse had been cast onto things. You could only be Latour, couldn't it? Right, like that. And they remain asleep like the servants of some enchanted castle. It's like some kind of toy story. <laughs> but they start shuddering and stretching and muttering. But I love this whole thing about the sort of reanimation of, of the, of the, of the, of the non-human. But I think theoretically it's a really important point as well. Um, waking them out of their dogmatic sleep. Very importantly, um, I don't have a quote for this, but I think it's an important point to make that from Latour is um, his, his distinction in 2005 between um, social actors which are intermediaries or those that are mediators, and he argues that an intermediary is um, that which um, transports meaning or force without its transformation, defining its inputs is enough to define its outputs, while mediators transform, translate, distort and modify the meaning of the elements they're supposed to carry. This is a really important point I want to make. He's drawing on actor network theory here and talking about um, social actors, human and non-human, primarily and predominantly as mediators. And he argues that intermediaries, intermediaries are rare, but mediators are common. I think this has got something to tell us in terms of you know, an analysis of, of, of um, meaning making in the university. 
pails in the post tube. This is ancient, but it's worth throwing it in. Um, I won't read it, but yeah, I suppose that's that's one of the points I want to. One of my important starting points as well. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just crack on. I'm sorry, I'm going quite quickly. But I want to talk a little bit, <laughs> I love that picture, about, about distributed authorship. It's just an excuse to show a fox with a pen, really. But, um, but I think one of the things I think is very interesting about Hales's conception of, of the post-human when applied to or attempted to apply to textualities and literacy practices is it does call into question assumptions about the nature and the identity of the, the, the the quote-unquote author, who is traditionally seen as a sort of stable and singular human individual. Um, but I would argue in the context of the contemporary university where most reading and writing takes place via digital devices or in a digitally saturated environment, um, it could be argued that the authorship is, is really um, radically and irrevocably distributed between human machine and, and the distributed agency of internet-based texts. Um, in the way that they, they, they act and actively contribute towards um, the process of authorship. So, so I think it's very difficult to consider the notion of the, of the, the single um, autonomous author um, really in any context. I mean, okay, we've always had intertextuality. This isn't a new idea. But I do think there's a qualitative difference when you introduce the digital in terms of the, the sheer volume and complexity of... of of, of textual agency that's involved. Um, Hales um, looks at this in her 2012 book, and she looks particularly at, at the effects of digital devices on student writing practices. It's very readable if you haven't looked at it already. It's a great book. And she points out, but she talks about screen reading um, being on the increase in print reading on the decline. Um, but in her earlier work, she also in, insists on a sort of recognition of the embodied and intermeshed nature of the relationship with digital media. So we're not talking about a kind of rarefied um, vision, Brave New World vision of, 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 of the digital engagement with the digital being um, in some sense um, disembodied. Instead, this is a bit long, but it's worth pick, picking a couple of points out here. Our interactions with digital media are embodied. They have bodily effects at the physical level. The actions of computers are also embodied, although they're a very different manner. I like the middle part there, the more one works with, the dig with digital technologies, the more one comes to appreciate the capacity of networks and programmable machines to carry out da -da -da, the extension of one's thoughts rather than the external. So it's the notion of the prosthesis. Again, embodiment takes the form of extended co cognition. I'm not going to get into the cognition thing, but I think Hales again is coming back to what she talked about in her earlier work as um, embodied um, virtuality. So, so the whole thing about um, and recognition of, of the permeation of the digital without collapsing into a binary of um, embodied versus disembodied, which I think is really important. And if we take it back to the university, we can see how, um, how, how this plays itself out. Now I'm going to talk a little bit, I won't have time to talk in too much detail, but we did a, 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 a the study I mentioned that's a little overview of some of the methodology that we use. This was JISC funded. This is a government agency which gave us some money to do this. Um, and we, we did a, a sort of set of different um, types of in investigations into student experiences. These were um, postgraduate students. Um, I won't go into the, the detail of the methodology too much. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the data in terms of... Um, Hales. I want to sort of try to link some of this stuff um, to some of Hales's ideas. Um, three, three points, I might just manage to, I'll see how I get on. But one, the first one I want to draw out is, is this statement where Hales says, materiality, like the object itself, is not a pre-given entity, but rather a dynamic process that changes as the focus, focus of attention shifts. So again, this notion of it's not sort of a priori kind of back cloth to, to social action, but it's something which is constantly emergent. The materiality itself is always unfolding. Um, in the data, we have um, some nice little pictures. And this is Sally. I asked Sally to, to draw me a picture in the interview. This wasn't pre-prepared, but she drew it out for me in the interview 
of her day-to-day -day life at the university and how she works with technologies. And this is Sally in the middle, running around between the train, various buildings, and she's got the VLE, and she's got internet, and public transport, and all sorts of things. Um, and I think there's a really strong sense of, obviously, spatial distribution. Um, and it's a very complex set of interlocking material and digital domains of practice. And this is just one student, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, Juan um, depicted his flat. And Juan's flat, he's drawn a line between home and university, but there's actually different areas of his house. So, like, his, I, think, I think the bedroom is... is off limits. He doesn't take his laptop in there, but he always he'll do with his university stuff in, in the in the rest of the house. Um, so there's quite a lot of evidence in the data of students' attempts to kind of, I suppose, inter intervene their agency with with this sense of like kind of permeation and try to sort of work with it and and and, and again this notion that the materiality of their their, their network and how they were engaging with meaning making was always emergent. Like Juan was always sort of thinking this was something that had to be worked on. It wasn't something which just was just a given. It was it was always worked upon. Yuki, one of the other students, said, well, I won't read through it, but you can skim it and see that she's talking quite a lot about the really curation. I mean she her whole um, relationship with, with, I think, technologies and, and sort of meaning-making practices generally was about curation and, and recording and portability in particular. And she, her, her iPad was very, very important to her. Uh, as we can see here, when she, she t told me in the data about, in her interview, about um, putting her iPod in a Ziploc bag and reading it in the bath. So um, she, was, she was so keen on using it. Um, this piece of technology. But I think this is actually quite interesting because it's kind of like, going back to Latour, there's, the iPad is a mediator here instead of an intermediary. Um, it changes the meaning of what's happening and it becomes a sort of trans-contextual um, object where the, the, the bath, which is like we normally associate with intimacy, personal space, becomes permeated, becomes a link, linked out and linked into the sort of almost infinite worlds of, of networks. Um, texts and devices. So it's coming back to Hale's, this notion of the, the changing assemblage, you know, that um, you can, just by the introduction of this device and the use of it, it transforms, I would argue, the, what we might conventionally see as the context of the bathroom. I think the bathroom and the bath and everything in it and, um, is, is part of an emergent network of, um, of material practice. How am I doing? Okay. Another long one, but let's just pick out the important points. So Hales is talking about time scales of human cognition and intelligent machines requires a theoretical framework where objects are seen not as static entities that once created remain the same, but are understood as constantly changing assemblages in which inequalities and inefficiencies in their operations drive them towards breakdown and so on. Objects in this view are more like technical individuals enmeshed in networks of social economic and technological relations, some of which are human and some non-human. Um, so the objects themselves are not, are not static either. They're not an unchanging reference point around which the, the social revolves, but instead they are themselves, particularly the digital, because, the, you know, the, okay, the sort of physical materiality of an, of an iPad may be relatively stable, but what the iPad is is in constant flux in terms of apps and, and changes that the user might be making to it, and the changes that it makes to itself constantly. So, um, looking at some of the examples of this, Juan says um, his favourite way of studying is sitting down with a book and a pen and some yellow paper, and he means like post-its. Um, you know, international students who didn't know the word post-it, but uh, I like combining the two, the demarcation lines between them. Remember he's the guy with the flat and it's got a demarcation line in the middle. Um, and this is my point I was trying to make earlier, that, the, that Juan's practice is maximising the degree to which he can materially interact with the text. Um, so highlighter pen becomes a mediator in Latour's terms as well, and so does the, the post-it note. Um, 
So I think this starts, this type of practice disrupts the notion of the, the sort of strong binary of um, digital and, and print literacy practice. Um, we have lots of examples in the data of people that making quite a lot of trouble to print things off and use highlighter pens and write notes in the margins. And I, I think that it's, there's more to that than just a, a sort of harking back to the, the pre-digital set of practices, but I think there is, it's, it's about the, 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 the maximising the deployment of mediators and intervention with the text um, through these objects, these print literacy artefacts. Okay, I'm going to do one more. And this is a bit complicated, but this is one as well. Because he asked me to, I asked him to tell me all about when he wrote an essay. I don't know if you can see how much of that you can read, but there's, you can get the gist, hopefully, that he, he's made a, a set of, sort of flowchart thing, um, showing how he, he wrote his essay, right? And, but I think this is a, the absolute masterpiece, as far as I'm concerned, but see, because it, if we're talking about the notion of the constantly changing assemblage, the complex interplay of print and digital, then it's all there, you know, the, the, the back and forward, that he's broken it down. I didn't have to go out and do an ethnography with this guy because he was doing it about his own practice. And you can see how the different stages go back and forward, handwritten notes, organised notes. He even put some videos in showing himself with his hands and with, with, with um, objects. So, well, I suppose, really, moving to a conclusion, what we see is the absence of what Latour would call the, 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 the neutral intermediary. It's quite striking. Instead, of all the devices and the artefacts um, appear to exhibit the features of the mediator. They're changing and transforming texts as they interact with them. I think this underscores Latour, Latour's contention that, that media, intermediaries are rare. Non-human actors are agentive in social pro um, process. They're, they're not tools, um, but they're actually transformative sort of boundary objects which are being used um, to transform not only the text, but also the, 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 the social actors themselves are transformed in interaction with them. Like humans, objects also have their embodiments. And embodiments matter no less than for humans. When objects acquire sensors and actuators, it is no exaggeration to say they have an umwelt in the sense that they perceive the world, draw conclusions based on their perceptions, and act on their perceptions. And my final point, which I can, I'm just going to squeeze in in the last five minutes, was um, a strand of work which we hadn't anticipated and we didn't put in research questions, but which came out. It was quite a, And I wish I'd made more of it now in the data. Maybe I'll get some funding to do another project and try and do some more about this, about the, the relationships people had with their devices. Um, you can see some quotes here. I mean, I won't go read them through, but you can, I think you get the, 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 the feeling of it there, the, you know, the notion of the, the cute little computer touching my laptop. UK in particular, I think, very, very intimate. She was the one with the iPod in the bath. Um, Nahid with his laptop as a constant companion. And he had a long story about going on long um, distance buses in Bangladesh with his, with his laptop as his companion, but also the, the, the laptop became an important symbolic object for him, it seemed to me, um, where it, it signified other things beyond simply a, a writing device. Um, and the third half of my brain is Giggle Scholar, which I just love, it. that's brilliant. Um, and Django talking about her use of, of digital um, devices, even uses the, the term circuit, which I thought was very, very interesting that she, that she just came up with that. So just to conclude, I think what we see in this data is that the objects are presented, are not presented as tools, which carry previously formulated stable meanings, as in Latour's notion of the intermediary. Instead, Latour's notion of the mediator was deployed throughout the analysis to characterise the agentive meaning-making and transformative nature of these objects, um, which we, I think we see in the, in the student accounts. And I suppose my contention in this paper is that a recognition of objects as agentive mediators as opposed to intermediaries offers a sort of transcontextual analysis and um, new analytical purchase on how we understand these kind of fine-grained 
and analyses of micro practices through which texts are, are generated and transformed. Um, the, the devices appear to be implicitly understood by students as social actors. The students haven't come across um, actor network theory or post-human theory, but it seemed to me that the, the statements that they made uh, suggested that there was a sense in which they, they regarded them as agentive. And I didn't have time to show you, there's a lot of other data about um, the spy in your pocket and people feeling like um, that they had to protect themselves against surveillance with digital um, technology as well. However, um, as I said, they're, they're rich in social signification. They're capable of creating meaning, um, but also we, we see this persistence of the, of the, 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 the artefacts, such as the pen, the paper, the, the post-it note, um, the, the means by which people can sort of physically, um, in an embodied way, intervene with texts. Um, and even when there, 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 there's little apps and things they could use instead, it seems like people were, were, were drawn towards doing that. So again, they don't seem to be neutral, passive objects, but more agentive actors, creatively enrolled in the processes of um, text production. So. I suppose my, my final conclusion, unsurprisingly, is that this, this blurs the comments. As I think, you know, Yannick has already set out in the in the, um, the the framing of this whole series. Is that, but I think this project maybe kind of underlines this that common sense binaries around um, supposed um, divisions between the text, the author, the human, the device, and the text and the context. I think are very very um, seriously undermined by a closer analysis of how. Um, texts are produced and um, interacted with. And that I've referred to the university, but I think that has um, relevance beyond that context as well. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. <laughs>